stories in politics, business, socioeconomic, sports, and documentaries. So catch all the updates on the happenings on the fact. International News on Atlantic Television Network, Festa Headlines. Egypt, President al-Sisi is sworn in for third term. Gaza, Israeli airstrike kills six aid workers. Russia, Ukrainian drones attack industrial facilities in Tatarstan. Details. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi was sworn in for his third term on Tuesday in the country's new capital, the largest of the mega-projects that have signified his rule while stretching the country's finances. Sisi swept to victory in an election last December with 89.6% of the vote and no serious challenges. While his message of stability and security resonated with some voters with the war raging in neighboring Gaza, many showed indifference occupied with rising prices and considering the result a foregone conclusion. Last month, Egypt allowed its currency to plummet after a $35 billion lifeline secured in a landmark deal with an Emirati wealth fund helped ease chronic foreign currency shortages that have hobbled imports and depleted reserves. The move and the renewed commitment to extensive reforms, including reducing the role of the state in business, paved the way for an expanded $8 billion deal from the International Monetary Fund. Since CC became president in 2014, Egypt has embarked on an infrastructure splodge spearheaded by the military, which CC says is essential for economic development and to accommodate a population that has grown by 6 million since hitting the 100 million four years ago. The $58 billion new administrative capital in the desert east of Cairo is the largest of the mega projects, which also include an expansion of the Suez Canal, extensive road building, and other new cities. Critics blame such projects for contributing to Egypt's economic woes, saying they divert resources and increase bur Egypt's debt burden. Though economic troubles threatened Egypt's stability, its global position has been bolstered by the Gaza crisis in which it has served as the main conduit for aid and an initiator of ceasefire talks. Sisi, a former intelligence general, rose to power in 2013 after deposing of the Muslims' brotherhood, Mohammed Mursi, Egypt's only freely elected president. Riots group estimates tens of thousands of people, including liberal activists, as well as Islamists have been jailed since Mercy's Uster. Sisi and his supporters say that stability and security are paramount and that the state is working to provide social rights such as housing and jobs. Kenyan public hospital doctors who have been on strike since last month convened in two major cities in tu on Tuesday to discuss their grievances across against the government. The Kenya Medical Practitioners, Pharmacists and Dentists Union, which represents over 7,000 members, went on strike on March 15th to demand payment of their salary arrears and the immediate hiring of trainee doctors. The arrears arose from a 2017 collective bargaining agreement, the union said. Doctors are also demanding the provision of adequate medical insurance cover for themselves and their dependents. It also wants the government to address frequent delays of salaries and to start paying doctors who work in public hospitals as part of their higher degree courses. The Minister of Health, Suzanne Nakumicha, has said the government cannot afford to hire the trainee doctors due to financial pressure on the public kitty. The Kenyan health sector, which doctors say is underfunded and understaffed, is routinely beset by strikes. Talks between the two sides aimed at ending the ongoing strike have so far not borne any deal and other health workers, such as clinical officers, have also joined the doctors in the strike. Domestic media reported on Tuesday. 
Third strike will take as long as it takes the government to wake up. Oyango Ndonga's chairman of KMPD's branch in the western city of Kim Kisumu said on citizen television ahead of the rallies by the doctors. The doctors have held a number of protests in the streets of the capital and other major cities since the strike began. A previous strike in 2017 lasted three months and some doctors in individual hospitals downed their tools at various times during the pandemic the COVID-19 pandemic to protest lack of personal protective equipment and other grievances. Basiru Diomaye Faye will be sworn in as Senegal's youngest president on Tuesday, pledging reforms to building on his to build on his stunning election win only 10 days after he was released from prison. The 44-year-old an Africanist left winger has never before held an elected office, but several African leaders, including Nigeria's Bola Ahmed Tinubu, are to attend the ceremony in the new town of Diam Niado near the capital Dakar. The formal handover of power with President Macky Sall will follow at the presidential palace in Dakar. Faye was one of a group's opposition politicians freed from prison 10 days before the 24th March presidential ballot under an amnesty announced by Sall, who had tried to delay the vote. Faye's campaign was launched while he he was still in detention. The former Tanzania will become the West Africa president since independence from France in 1960 and will be admitted to having a polygamous marriage. Working with his populist mentor, Osmani Sonko, who was barred from the election, Faye declared their priorities in his victory speech, national reconciliation, easing a cost of living crisis and fighting corruption. The anti-establishment leader has vowed to restore national sovereignty over key assets such as the oil, gas, and f fishing sectors. Faye wants to leave the regional CFA franc, which he sees as a property, and invest more in agriculture with the aim of reaching food self-sufficiency. He has also sought to reassure investors that Senegal will remain a friendly country and a sure and reliable ally for any part that engages with us in virtuous, respectful, and mutually productive cooperation. After three years, years and deadly unrest in a traditionally stable country, his democratic victory was hailed from Washington to Paris via the African Union and the European Union. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, on Monday spoke with the president-elect by telephone and underscored the United States' strong interest in deepening the partnership between the the State Department said. On the international stage, Fai seeks to bring military run Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger back into the fold of regional economic community of West African states, BLOC, commonly known as DMI or the other one in the local Sierra language. He won the election with 54.3% of the vote. It was a remarkable turnaround after the government had dissolved the past deaf party he founded with Sonko in 2014. With Sao postponing the election, Faye, a practiced Muslim from a humble background with two wives and four children, presents, represents a new generation of youthful politicians. He has voiced admiration for the U.S. ex-president Barack Obama and the South African anti apartheid hero Nelson Mandela. However, Faye and the government he must unveil will quickly face major challenges. He does not have a majority in the National Assembly and will have to look to build fine alliances to pass new laws or call a legislative election, which will become an option from mid-November. The biggest challenge will be creating enough jobs in a nation where 75% of the 18 million population is under 35 and the unemployment rate is officially 20%. Many youths have considered the future so bleak they have risked risk their lives to and the waves of migrants trying to reach Europe. Namibian authorities are investigating, investigating a surge in rhino poaching that has seen 28 rhinos poached already this year, two-thirds of them in the southern African country's flagship Atosha National Park. It was particularly concerning that 19 rhinos were poached in Atosha this year, given the park is a focus for conservation efforts and a major international tourist attraction, the Environment Ministry said in a statement on Monday. Of the rhinos poached, 19 were critically endangered black rhinos and nine near-threatened white rhinos. No suspects have been arrested yet. We condemn the Bavarian 
take actions of those involved in and urge anyone with any information that may assist us in apprehending the suspects to come forth, the ministry statement said. Rhinos are poached for their hunts, horns, which are used in East Asian countries for making traditional medicines and jewelry. 67 rhinos were poached in Namibia in 2023, a significant decrease from the previous year when rhino poaching reached an all-time high. An apparent Israeli airstrike killed six international aid workers with the World Central Kitchen and their Palestinian driver, the charity said Tuesday, in a, in a potentially major setback to efforts to deliver aid by sea to Gaza, where Israel's offensive against Hamas has pushed hundreds of thousands of Palestinians to the brink of starvation. The food charity founded by celebrity Chef Jose Andres said it was immediately suspending operations in the region. Footage showed the bodies, several wearing protective gear, with the charity's logo at a hospital in the central Gaza town of Deir al-Bala. Those killed include three British nationals, an Australian, a Polish national, and an American-Canadian dual citizen, according to hospital records. The source of fire late Monday could not be independently confirmed. The Israeli military said it was conducting a review to understand the circumstances of this tragic incident. The charity said the team was traveling in a three-car convoy that included two armored vehicles. Despite coordinating movements with the Israeli army, the convoy was hit as it was leaving the Deir al warehouse, where the team had unloaded more than 100 tons of humanitarian food aid brought to Gaza on the maritime route. Aaron Gore, the CEO of the charity, said this is not only an attack against WCK, this is an attack on humanitarian organizations showing up in the most dire of situations where food is being used as a weapon of war. This is unforgivable. Three aid ships from the Mediterranean island nation of Cyprus arrived earlier Monday carrying some 400 tons of food and supplies organized by the charity and the United Arab Emirates, the group's second shipment after a pilot run last month. The Israeli military was involved in coordinating both deliveries. World Central Kitchen, an international charity that has brought hundreds of tons of food aid into Gaza, has said seven of its workers were killed on Monday night in an airstrike carried out by the Israel Defense Forces. Despite coordinating movement with the IDF, the convoy was hit as it was leaving the Deir al-Bala warehouse, where the team had unloaded more than 100 tons of food aid brought to Gaza on the maritime route. The charity said in a statement, WCK said the workers had been traveling in two armored cars bearing the charity's logo and a soft skin vehicle. The IDF had said, has said it is conducting a thorough review at the high levels to understand the circumstances of this tragic incident. It added that the IDF makes extensive efforts to enable the safe delivery of humanitarian has been working closely with WK in their vital efforts to provide food and humanitarian aid to the people of Gaza. WCK has paused its operation in the region while it decides on future activities. The seven WCK workers who were killed were from Australia, Poland, and the, the UK and Palestine, and one was a dual US-Canadian citizen. The Australian government named one of them as Lazalmi, Zomi Fancom, a 43-year-old Melbourne-born aid worker. It said it confirmed her death with overwhelming sadness, adding that her tireless work to improve the lives of others should never have cost Ms. Fancom her own. Fancom's family described her as a kind, selfless, and outstanding human being who traveled the world helping others in their time of need. WCK was founded by Spanish-American chef Jose Andres in response to the 2010 Haiti earthquake. It has since grown into a global charity that has provided food to refugees at the U.S. border as well as working in Venezuela and Ukraine. Over the past few weeks, WCK has brought about 600 tons of food and aid to northern Gaza using a maritime aid corridor that was opened last month. The charity says it has so far provided Palestinians facing starvation with more than 43 mil mil meals that have been delivered by land, air and sea. Iran and one of its key proxies vowed Tuesday to respond to a strike widely attributed to Israel that demolished 
Iran's consulate in the Syrian capital of Damascus and killed eight people, including two Iranian generals. Iran State TV reported Tuesday that the country's Supreme National Security Council, a key decision-making body, met late Monday and decided on a required response to the strike. The report said the meeting was chaired by President Ibrahim Raisi, but provided no further details. Israel has repeatedly targeted military officials from Iran, which supports militant groups fighting Israel in Iran along its border with Lebanon. Monday's strike in Damascus signaled an escalation because it struck an Iranian mission. It was not clear if Iran would respond itself, risking a dangerous confrontation with Israel and its ally, the United States, or if it would continue to rely on proxies, including Lebanon's Hezbollah militia and Yemen's Houthi rebels. The airstrike in Syria killed General Mohammad Rez Reza Zahedi, who led the elite Quds force in Lebanon and Syria until 2016, according to Iran's Revolutionary Guard. It also killed Zahedi's Deputy General Mohammed Hadi Haj Rahimi and five other officers. Hezbollah said Tuesday that Zahedi played a crucial role in helping develop and advance the work of the group in Lebanon. A Hezbollah member was also killed in Monday's strike, bringing the overall death toll to eight. The Hezbollah announced the death of Hussein Youssef on Tuesday, but did not provide further details. This crime will certainly not pass without the enemy receiving punishment and revenge, Hezbollah said in a statement. Since the outbreak of the war in Gaza nearly six months ago, those proxies have stepped up attacks, leading to near-daily cross-border exchanges between Hezbollah and Israel and frequent Houthi attacks, Red Sea, as which rules Gaza and attacks Israel on October. October 7 is also backed by Iran. Israeli struck against Iranian targets had no comment on the latest attack in Syria, although a military spokesman blamed Iran for a drone attack early Monday against the naval base in southern Israel. Israeli strikes on Iran consulate in Syria have left at least 11 people dead, among them Brigadier General Mohammad Reza Zahedi, the highest ranking Iranian military official to be killed since the January 2020 assassination of General Qasem Soleimani in Baghdad. Zahedi was a senior commander in Al Quds Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, clandestine foreign intelligence and paramilitary wing. He commanded units in Lebanon and Syria and was most likely a critical figure in Iran's relationship with Hezbollah and Syria's President Bashar al-Assad. General Mohammed Hadi Hajj Rahimi, Zahidi's deputy, and the deputy of coordination with Al-Quds was also killed in the airstrike, along with at least five other IRGC advisors. Al-Quds force, which relies on networks of people across the Middle East to operate, now faces challenges in its operations. Saeed Golka, an assistant professor of political science at the University of Tennessee, said Zahedi's death was the IRGC's most significant loss since the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. The IRGC is still reliant on one man and his networks. It cannot function independently of them, said Golka. When you eliminate a key figure within the hierarchy coupled with the death of Zahidi's deputy, it triggers institutional disarray. Finding a successor to Zahidi, particularly amid the crisis in the Middle East, will now be a time-consuming endeavor, Golka said. Zahidi, better known among IRGC, foot soldiers as Hassan Mardavi, joined the elite military force two years after the 1917 Islamic Revolution, which brought the clerical establishment to power. He received his initial command position during the Iran-Iraq war when he led a small brigade of soldiers. After the war, Zahedi was promoted to lead a larger headquarters primarily focused on training military students. In 2005, he attained his first high-ranking position when the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, appointed him as the commander of the IRGC's ground forces. A few years ago, he trained Iranian forces on methods to quell anti-regime protests on the outskirts of Tehran. After establishing a close relationship with Soleimani, who commanded the IRGC's Quds force, before his death, Zahedi began regularly meeting with Hassan Israela, the secretary general of the Lebanese Hezbollah militant group. Zahedi became pivotal in the supply of Iranian-made missiles to Hezbollah and had sanctioned sanctions imposed on him by the U.S. In contrast to previous similar attacks, Iran promptly confirmed Zahedi's death 
On Monday, they retaliate, Saheli's son has urged Iran not to let his father's death go unanswered. Iran and Syrian Akbari said Iran's, respond, Iran's response to the strike would be at the same magnitude and harshness. The foreign ministers of Iran and Syria also pointed fingers at Israel for orchestrating the attack. Iran will retaliate, but a major war between the two countries is unlikely. The IRGC would likely target certain positions somewhere like Erbil in Iraq or the Republic of Azerbaijan. China has a unique opportunity to drive forward an energy revolution in Africa, but it must first reserve nearly two decades of neglect of green power investments there, research from Boston University showed on Tuesday. Beijing has emerged as the continent's biggest bilateral trading partner since the start of the century and has financed billions of dollars worth of large-scale infrastructure projects. Three years ago, China's President Xi Jinping said the country would not, not build new coal-fired power projects abroad, pledging to deal with climate change by supporting the development of green and low-carbon energy. Although Africans' green energy potential is one of the highest in the world, Chinese lending and investment has so far provided relatively little support for the continent's energy transition, according to a report from Boston, University's Global Development Policy Center, and the African Economic Research Consortium. Lending for renewables such as solar and wind from China's two main development finance institutions constituted just 2% of their $52 billion of energy loans from 2000 to 2022, while more than 50% is allocated to fossil fuels. Given current economic challenges and future energy opportunities, China can play a role in contributing to Africa's energy access and transition through trade, finance and FDI, the report said. Chinese development finance institutions have been focused on investing the extra extraction and export of commodities to China and in electrification projects. Chinese lending has targeted many of the same sectors that produce the oil and minerals that flow back to China. At least eight hydropower projects financed by the Export-Import Bank of China, which represents 26% of all hydropower lending, are intended to support the extraction of various metals. Although the strike has led to export revenues for African economies, African countries are not yet receiving the full benefits of renewable energy technologies, the report said. In 2022, fossil fuels accounted for around 75% of total electricity generation in Africa and about 90% of energy consumption, the report said. Three stores belonging to a Malaysian mini-mart chain that sold socks carrying the word, the word Allah have been targeted with Molotov cocktails over the past week in a rare case of such violence. One of the KK Supermart stores in Kuching, the capital of Sarawak in Malaysian Borneo, was hit by a Molotov cocktail on Sunday, a day after a separate attack on a store in Fahang on the east coast of Peninsula, Malaysia. On 26 March, a store in Perak was also targeted with a patrol bomb, though it did not ignite, according to local media. No one was injured in the incidents, which are being investigated by police. The attacks came after pictures of socks bearing the word Allah at one of the chain stores were shared widely on social media, provoking outrage among Muslims who viewed use of word in association with feet to be offensive. Mostly Muslim ethnic Malays make up two-thirds of Malaysia's population, while the country also has large ethnic Chinese and Indian minorities. Chai Ki Khan, the CEO of KK Supermart, the country's second largest chain of convenience stores, and his wife, a company director, were charged with hurting religious feelings last week, while three other three officials from supplier Xinjiang Chang has been have been charged with abetting them. All five pleaded not guilty. They could face up to one year in prison or a fine or both if convicted. Chai Ki Khan blamed the supplier which the chain is is, is suing and said that only 14 pairs of Allah socks were found on the shelves at three KK supermarket outlets. Both companies have apologized. The suppliers said the socks were part of a larger shipment of 18,800 pairs ordered from China. The use of the word Allah has long been a highly contentious issue in Malaysia, where court cases have been heard over whether the word 
can be used by indigenous Christians in their religious worship. Such controversy had, however, been largely confined to the courtroom, said James Chai, visiting fellow at the ECS Yusuf Ishak Institute, Singapore. The sale of the socks was a flashpoint for wider tensions, he said, pointing to the success of the Islamic-based party in the 2022 elections. Many people attribute this to years of segregation by race and religion, as well as the growing number of Islamic institutions, including schools, that have built a more conservative mindset within society, he said. Some politicians, including the youth chief for the UMNO, a Malay political party, which is in the governing coalition of the Prime Minister, Anwar Ibrahim, have been accused of finding anger by calling for a boycott of the stores. After the patrol bomb incident, Sultan Ibrahim, the king of Malaysia, has called for unity, saying community leaders must act with maturity. A senior police figure also warned against escalation, saying there should not be a repeat of the 2001 Kampung Medan riots, which occurred between the Indian and Malay communities, local media reported. James Chai of the ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute said there were no indications yet that the tensions could escalate to the level seen in 2001 or in 1969 when deadly racial riots occurred between the Malay and Chinese communities. He added the patrol attacks should serve as a caution that the harmony and peace that you have in the racial communities should not be taken for granted. Japanese citizens will all have the same family name in 500 years time unless married couples are permitted to use the separate surnames. A new study has suggested as part of a campaign to update a civil code dating back to the late 1800s. The study led by Hiroshi Yoshida, a professor at economy at, of economy at Tohoku University, projected that if Japan continues to insist that couples select a single surname, every single Japanese person will be known as Sato-san by 2531. Yoshida conceded that his projections were based on several assumptions, but said the idea was to use numbers to explain the present system's potential effects on Japanese society to draw attention to the issue. If everyone becomes Sato, we may have to be addressed by our first names or by numbers, he said, according to the Mainichi. I don't think that would be a good world to live in. Sato already tops the list of Japanese surnames accounting for 1.5% of the total population, according to a March 2023 study with Suzuki a close second. Some social media users wrongly assumed the study, first reported on Monday but published in March, was an April Fool's Day prank. But Yoshida said he wanted it to give people he wanted it to give people pause for thought. A nation of Satos will not only be inconvenient but also undermine individual dignity, he said, according to the Asahi Shimbun, adding that the trend would also lead to the loss of family and regional heritage. According to Yoshida's calculation, the proportion of Japanese named Sato increased 1.83 times from 2022 to 23, assuming the rate remains constant and there is no change to the laws on surnames, around the half of the Japanese population will have that name in 24 to 46, rising to 100% in 2531. Couples in Japan have to choose which surname to share when they marry, but in 95% of cases, it is a woman who changes her name. However, the picture would be different if Japan's government submitted to growing pressure to allow married couples to use separate surnames. The study contained an alternative scenario extrapolated from a 2022 survey by the Japanese Trade Union Confederation in which 39.3% of 1,000 employees aged 20 to 59 said they wanted to share a surname even if they had the option of using separate ones. Under those circumstances, Yoshida, whose study was commissioned by the Think Name Project and other organizations that want to legalize the opportunity to select your surname projected that by 2531, only 7.96% of the Japanese population would be named Sato, the Mainichi Shimbun reported. Groups calling for a change in the law of unmarried surnames hope their campaign will receive a boost from the prospect that Suzuki's Watanabe's and, indeed, people called Yoshida, the 11th most common surname, could one day disappear. While the government has allowed mating names to appear alongside married names on passports, driving licenses and resident certificates, Japan remains the only country in the world that requires spouses to use the same name. 
Conservative members of the ruling Liberal pa Democratic Party say changing the law would undermine family unity, family unity and cause confusion among children. You are watching the International News on Atlantic Television Network. We will be back after this break. From line across the ocean to the land beyond the mountains, through the Sahara, we bring on sport news, live analysis, expert discussions on trending stories in politics, business, socioeconomic, sports, and documentaries. So catch all the updates on the happenings around the globe. Stay focused on the fact today, only on ATN. politics, business, socio-economy, sports, and documentaries. So catch all the updates on the happenings around the globe. Stay focused on the fact today, only on ATN. This is the International News on Atlantic Television Network. Now the rest of our stories. Ukraine and drones attacked industrial facilities in the province of Tatarstan 
Russian authorities said Tuesday in what would be Kyiv's deepest strike inside Russian territory since the war began more than two years ago. Seven people were injured in the attack on facilities near the cities of Yelabuga and Nizhez Kamask, located some 1,200 kilometers east of Ukraine, Russian regional authorities said. The strike damaged a, hotel, a hostel for students and workers in a free economic zone where a factory manufacturing Iranian-designed drones is reportedly located, other media reports said. Tatarstan is known for its high level of industrialization. Tatarstan officials said the attack didn't disrupt industrial production, while Nize Kamsmeyer said the attempt to strike a refinery was thwarted by air defenses. Kyiv's officials normally neither claim nor deny responsibility for attacks on Russian soil, though they sometimes refer obliquely to them. The Associated Press could not independently verify the reports. Ukrainian drone developers have for months been extending the weapons range, part of Kyiv's efforts to compensate for its battlefield disadvantage in weapons and troops. The unmanned aerial vehicles are also an affordable option while Ukraine awaits more U.S. military aid. Neither side is currently able to make much of a dent on the around 1,000 kilometer front line. Ukraine previously has launched drone attacks in and around St. Petersburg, which lies about 1,000 kilometers north of the border. But the facilities in Tatarstan, a province on the Volga River, appears to be the most distant target Ukraine has tried to hit. In recent weeks, Russian refineries and oil terminals have targets of Ukrainian drone attacks. Part of stepped up assaults on Russian territory, including long range drone attacks. A 12 year old student opened fire at a secondary school in southern Finland and wounded three other students on Tuesday, police said. The suspect was later arrested, police said. Heavily armed police cordoned off the lower secondary school with some 800 students in the city of Vanta, just outside the capital. Helsinki, after receiving a call about a shooting incident at 9.08 a.m., police said both the suspects and the wounded were 12 years old. Police said the, the suspect was arrested in the Helsinki area later Tuesday. Ministers and officials from dozens of countries are gathering in the Netherlands on Tuesday for a conference on restoring justice in Ukraine as the war sparked by Russia's invasion drags on in its third devastating year. Among speakers will be the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, which has issued arrest warrants for Russian President Vladimir Putin and military officers linked to the war. The people of Ukraine, they want to see justice delivered, Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba said as he arrived for the conference. His Dutch counterpart, Heike Brian Slot, agreed. These horrendous crimes of Russia cannot go unpunished. There is no place for impunity, she said. During the conference, a register of damage caused by Russia's invasion will formally open a process that will allow people to submit claims for compensation for damages, loss or injury suffered as a result of the invasion. The Council of Europe, whose members established a register in May last year, said in a statement that the Tuesday launch will focus on claims for damage or destruction of residential property. It said that between 300,000 and 600,000 claims are expected. The Hague-based register of damage caused by the aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine or RD4U aims to allow more claims soon, including related to damage or destruction of Ukrainian critical infrastructure. The register will not pay out any claims, but it is a stepping stone towards an international compensation mechanism that has not yet been established. The Hague is central to efforts to bring justice to Ukraine. It is home to the International Criminal Court and the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression against Ukraine. And the Dutch government has offered to host a special tribunal on the crime of aggression. While the ICC is investigating crimes in Ukraine, it does not have jurisdiction to prosecute the crime of aggression in the conflict. A letter signed by almost 60 charities, law firms and organizations will be sent to the Home Secretary calling for the creation of a Ukrainian a Ukraine star visa scheme for Palestinians trapped in Gaza who have family in the UK. The letter signed by the Refugee Council Claire, Care for Carlis and the Helen Bamper Foundation says 
existing immigration routes are insufficient and not working and described how a Gaza family scheme would enable Palestinians in Gaza to reunite with their immediate and extended family members in the UK. More than 30,000 people have been killed in Gaza since the 7th October attack on Israeli civilians when 1,200 people were killed and about 250 people taken hostage by Hamas militants. The letter addressed to the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, will be sent on Tuesday. It calls for the Home Office to urgently create a Gaza family scheme to protect human life and the right to family unity until it is safe for Palestinians to return, especially as fears grow of an impending Israeli ground assault in Rafah. The Home Office has said it doesn't have, a plan, doesn't have plans to establish a separate route for Palestinians to come to the UK. Last week, Scotland's First Minister, Hamza Yousaf, backed the Gaza family's reunited campaign calling for a family reunion scheme. The letter, whose signatories include the law firms Bernberg, Pierce and Duncan Lewis, says eligible Palestinians have been unable to apply for family reunion visas due to the Home Office's requirement to enroll biometric data, including fingerprints. Although the Home Office does, does offer the ability to differ the requirement of biometrics, the latest says most of these applications have been rejected and two people have been killed in Gaza while waiting for a decision. The letter reads, Palestinians in Gaza are thus trapped in a catch-22. The British government is demanding that they register biometrics, but it is denying them a viable way of doing so. It is in this context that Palestinian families in the UK have called for a Gaza family scheme alongside a permanent and immediate ceasefire. The Home Secretary's refusal to make decisions on the reunion application of three families who were trapped in Gaza due to their inability to provide biometrics was found to be unlawful and breached their rights under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights in an upper tribunal in early March. Hundreds of Palestinian families in the UK have resorted to tr raising tens of thousands of pounds via fundraisers to facilitate the evacuation of their families through a private company in Egypt. Since the October attack, 55,000 donations have been made and 430 funds set up in the UK mentioning evacuate or evacuation in relation to the crisis in Gaza. According to exclusive figures shared with The Guardian by GoFundMe, a petition calling for a Palestinian family visa scheme has been signed by more than 54,000 people so far. It requires 100,000 signatories in order to be considered for a debate in Parliament. A Home Office spokesperson said, We are working around the clock to get British nationals who want to leave out of Gaza. We have a team on the ground in Cario and at, at the Rafa Crossing providing consular assistance. Any dependents of British citizens who need a visa can apply for one. Heavy gunfire erupted Monday in the downtown area of Haiti's capital as police battled gang members near the National Palace for several hours. Local media reported that at least one policeman was shot after he and other officers were forced to flee an armored car that was later set on fire. Scores of people were trapped by the gunfire in downtown Port-au-Prince while a dozen of others managed to flee. One man, who declined to provide his name out of fear for his life, told the Associated Press that he was stuck for five hours until police rescued him. It is the armored car that covered us, so we could leave the area, he said. A spokesman for Haiti's National Police did not return messages for comment. The latest gun battle comes more than a month after powerful attack uh, powerful gangs began attacking key government infrastructure. They have torched police stations, opened fire on the main international airport that remains closed and stormed the country's two biggest prisons, releasing more than 4,000 inmates. The violence has somewhat subsided in certain areas since the attacks on February 29th, but gunfire still echoes daily. At least 1,554 people have been reported killed up to March 22nd and another 826 injured, according to the UN. The situation forced Prime Minister Errol Henry to announce last month that he would resign as soon as a transitional council is created. Henry, who was on official trip to Kenya to push for the UN-backed deployment of a police force from the East African country, remains locked out of Haiti. The proposed transitional council of nine members, which has yet to be formally established, will be responsible for choosing a new prime minister and council of ministers. 
On Monday night, Haiti's government issued a statement ra raising concerns over its creation, saying that the current council of members stumbled over proven constitutional and legal questions. The constitution and Haiti laws nowhere provide for this institution. Peruvian President Dina Bolate replaced six ministers after they resigned as her government is rocked by a political crisis fueled by an alleged illicit enrichment scandal involving luxury, luxury watches. The cabinet shake-up Monday came as lawmakers submitted to parliament a request to remove her from office for permanent moral incapacity. Three days later, the police broke down the front door of her resident to search for the watches as part of an investigation. The request was submitted by lawmakers from various parties, including Peru Libre, to which Poloate once belongs, belonged. To remove Poloate, the move requires 87 votes from the 130-seat unicameral parliament, and, also, and so far, five parties that together have 54 votes support for the president following the raid. Poloate is being preliminary investigated for allegedly acquiring an undisclosed collection of luxury watches since becoming vice president and social inclusion minister in July 2021 and then president in December 2022. Lawmakers in their request to remove her from office cite the investigation against Boloate as countrywide problems, such as rising crime, she has denied the illicit enrichment accusations. Late Friday, armed police officers broke down the front door of Boloati's house with a battering ram in search of Rolex watches. The raid marked the first time in Peru's history that police forcibly entered the home of a sitting president. The probe began in mid-March after a TV show spotlighted Boloati wearing a Rolex watch that is worth up to $14,000 in Peru. Other TV shows later mentioned at least two more Rolexes. Boloate, a 61-year-old lawyer, was a modest district official before entering then-President Pedro Castillo's, Castillo's government on a monthly salary of $8,136. In July 2021, Boloate later ex assumed the presidency with a lower salary of $4,200 per month. Shortly thereafter, she began to display the luxury watches. And that's the international news for today. Before we go, another look at the major stories. I am Valentina Lawrence. Thank you for watching. You can follow us on all our social media networks on X Atlantic TV Net, Facebook and YouTube Atlantic Television Network, Instagram Atlantic TV Network. Or you can watch us live on our website, AtlanticNetwork.tv. Do remember that peace and unity are the pathways to progress. Thank you. Have a lovely afternoon. From the line across the ocean to the land beyond the mountains, through the Sahara, we bring on sport news, live analysis, expert discussions on trending stories in politics, business, socio-economy, sports, and documentaries. So catch all the updates on the happenings around the globe. Stay focused on the fact today. Only on ATN.